Welcome to the latest of our 25 for 25 podcast. I'm, I'm delighted to be joined by former Newcastle player Michael Chopra. Michael, it's good to have you on. This is 25 for 25, a show racism the red card podcast. Make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. It's good to have another uh, <laughs> another two army player on. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Welcome. No, thanks, Shaka. No, do you know what? It's a pleasure being on and especially being on with yourself as well. I remember going to the Newcastle games and, and watching you when you were in, in, uh, as a goalkeeper there. And look, the best times for Newcastle were when, when you were standing goal, uh, the entertainers and everything. Um, so look, it's a pleasure actually being on here and speaking to you. Uh, clearly, you, you got the notes from from the team. Flattery will get you everywhere, Michael. <laughs> uh, it's it's really, so. Let, let me. We we were, we were talking briefly. Tell tell me a little bit about where you are now. What you're doing. What what takes up what takes up your day. Yeah, so I'm currently living in between Amsterdam and, and Newcastle. Um, my wife is Dutch Indonesian. I've got a little boy in. In Amsterdam, um, but I've got a I've got a fourteen year old in Newcastle as well with my ex wife. Um, mm. But I've been I was living in Amsterdam for the last five years, and um, there's a charity called Football for Peace, which helps underprivileged kids. Um, they work really close with the UN as well on, under their their goals. So what what Football for Peace done is they decided to take five goals out of what the UN done and do it for themselves and and build a charity around it. Um, Meza Ozil's an ambassador. Um, mm. So what we've done, obviously, there's a big problem in, in the UK for lack of Asian, South British Asian players. Obviously, being Asian myself, it it really comes to my mind and hurts me that there's not a lot more playing in, in the Premier League or in, in the Championship mm. and so on. So what Meza Ozil decided to do with the charity is he wanted to build a football centre. Um, obviously, with Meza being Muslim, uh, he wanted to do it in, in Bradford. So... Mm. We decided to do a Meza Ozil uh, Peace Football Centre in Bradford. Um, we get a lot of Asian kids coming to it. We teamed up with um, Sport and Equals, Bradford City Football Club, the University of Bradford. Um, so it, it was really good. Um, we get a lot of kids coming to the sessions on a Sunday. I go down to Bradford and, and train the kids for an hour. And then if the kids are good enough, we'll put them into Bradford City or if they're better than Bradford mm. City, we'll take them to the next club. In, in a different league um, so really it's trying to give the the kids the Asian kids a, a chance to get on that pathway which is uh, which sometimes have, have been ignored Have there been any other initiatives such, such as this or su- such as any other that, that targets the South Asian community and, and getting them involved in the game uh, um, at, at any level? So I think I made my debut in 2002 so considering I think there's only been probably five players that have played in the Premier League since then, and that's you're talking 20 years ago. So yeah. there is a factor. Are they are they getting overlooked? To me, they are. They don't get uh, scouted. There's a big problem. Um, some of the scouts are saying it's just the mentality. Asian kids are too weak. Their mentality is not there. But also, you've got to you've got to try and educate the parents as well because I go back to when I was a kid. My dad was all football, football, football. But my mm. cousin. Uh, their family was all academics. You've got to go to right. school, you've got to go to university. Sports not going to make you a, a career. Um, so you look at it now, football's changing the way people think about um, life. And obviously, Asian families now know that if their kid's a footballer, then you can look after the family sort of thing. It's not, you've got to be a lawyer, you've got to go down the academic route to or mm-hmm. the family sort of thing. I've heard a lot of those very cliches yeah. and the fact that, or supposed fact that it was cricket that was taking yeah. so many South Asian communities away away from football. But you clearly made made your part. So, so tell me about tell me about your own progress in in the game. You represented England at, at all the junior levels. Yeah. Um, just so, just you said that your father was was a football fan and supported your your footballing dreams. But it feels certainly for the time that was unique in a way. Just I'd like to hear a little bit more of your own first-hand experience 
coming through in, in a sport that was underrepresented in, in your own community? Look, everyone's well well and well aware that Asian um, Asian people run uh, news agents. My dad was exactly the same. He had a, he had a news agent in, in Gateshead, which is just mm-hmm. across the water from Newcastle. He used to go to work at five o'clock in the morning, come home at eight o'clock at night. So it was mm-hmm. my mum that was looking after me during the day. Uh, but come the weekend, when Newcastle were playing on a on a Saturday, he'd be taking me to the matches. Come on a Sunday when when I'm playing playing Sunday league football, he'd be the one that was was standing in the rain watching me play football. So I had I had the confidence of my dad being behind me of being at these uh, all these activities and um, taking me to to football matches and, and watching my, my boyhood heroes. But like I said before, unless you've got the the backing and the support from your parents, it, it, it's it's going to be hard for young Asian players. Uh, to come through the ranks because look I, I, I see it when I mentioned before when I take the kids uh, down at Bradford coaching now the parents drop them off and they disappear for an hour and mm-hmm. it's kind of babysitting the kids for one hour at a time while they go and do something else it's it's disappointing but we do workshops with the parents and we try and educate them that you've got to support your kids and you've got to fully understand what they want to do it's not all about mm-hmm. what you want your kids to do it's what they want to do in life um, so yeah as a uh, look my dad was a he played for Newcastle as a as a schoolboy and stuff like that. But when I was playing for England, I didn't really see myself as as being Asian. I just see myself as a Michael Chopra from Newcastle, mm-hmm. loving football and just wanting to play football. It wasn't really until I'm, I started to play and made my debut at Newcastle when people started to make a big thing. Or he's the first Asian in the Premier League. He's going to be a role model for people and, and this sort of thing. And, Look, it didn't it didn't bother me. I didn't have a weight on my shoulder to that I was the first one to break through and, and this sort of thing. At the end of the day, I loved football and I just wanted to to play football. It didn't matter who it was for. I, I, I find that a really interesting perspective. Um I, I think often as as adults we look back on, on our time or, or experiences um as as kids that we maybe neglected, we just were weren't aware of. Um and, and see through see through a different lens as 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 grown people as 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 parents. So yeah. you're seeing as 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 a kid coming through in in, in the northeast, um, where South Asians are desperately underrepresented in the sport. You never really felt. You never really felt like race was a factor. No, uh, do you know what, Chuck? I was really lucky because when when people look at me, they don't think I'm Asian. Um, mm. Not many people know this, but my, my my proper name is actually Rocky Michael Chopper, but I, I go by Michael Chopper. It could have been different because if 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 I was known as Rocky Chopper, then people would have automatically look knew I was Asian from a younger age. But I went by the, right. the name of Michael. I don't know why. I haven't really asked my parents that either. But I think um, I think that's probably one of the reasons why I was lucky, especially. Being in the northeast and, and and that sort of thing, I didn't really get any um, any racial abuse from anyone. And look, the northeast is is a hotbed for football. Um, it's a it's a friendly community, so you don't really get that much racism even even in in Newcastle. Um, everybody kinds to come together, but you're right in saying that um, they are underrepresented. Now I know for a fact if you go to um, where where most of the Asians are based on the West Road. Um, there's a lot of football pitches up there now. I guarantee if you went up there, there'd be a handful of players that are good enough to to play in in junior levels at, at Newcastle or, or Sunderland, and so on. It's just for me personally, I don't think the scouts are going out there looking for this. I think it's probably more of a like I said before, the scouts are of Newcastle and I don't mind saying this because I know who they are and everything they're more old school now the game and, and life has, has totally changed from that and mm. hopefully with the way things football's going at the minute and the big talk about South British Asians and that sort of thing hopefully more and more can, can co- come through the ranks um, I, I, was, I was speaking to Steve Harper a couple of months ago I went down the academy and I asked him how many how many um, South British Asian players you got, how many black players you got in, in, in the full academy? And he, mm. there's only a handful. Now, why is that possible when you've got from under nines, under eights, all the way through to 
the 23s, that there's only a handful of, uh, of black players and in, in, in Asian players playing for the academy. Why are they not going out there and, and looking for these players? Because they are good enough. They, they, they should make a stand and, and, and try and help these kids come through the ranks. So, let me ask you, you say you never really... Um, that weight of being, being Asian, you never really felt growing up and, and playing in, in Newcastle. Because um, that, that, that's your community. What about in representing England? Any, any experiences, any, any moments there that, that maybe stood out that were different from, from your own experiences in the Northeast? Do you know what, Shaka? Um, and I, it hurts me saying this, but I think uh, there was a time, uh, might have been, let me think, might have been 2007. Mm. Uh, now, England had a big striker crisis. And they then went down, they went down to the championship uh, to, to bring a striker into the England setup. Um, so obviously it was between me and David Nugent uh, at the time. Yeah. I was top scorer in the championship. I think I was four goals ahead of David Nugent. Um, and he got picked ahead of me. Now, it took me by surprise. Mm. It, I was really surprised at that because at the time I was flying. I was scoring goals for fun. I was enjoying football. Um, and somebody, so I, th- I didn't really think of this. And somebody actually said to me, I wonder if it's because you're Asian. That's why you didn't get picked to play for England because of the, the politics and, and, and this sort of thing. And then it, it, more and more people started to say it to me and it kind of started to hurt me a bit because I can't change how I've been brought up and how my family is. Mm-hmm. All I can do is go out on my pitch and, and, and play football. That's it. I can only affect what, what's in front of me with a ball. So, yeah, it did hurt me a bit thinking that that could have been a possibility that stopped me playing f- for England because of, I would have been the first ever Asian uh, to ever mm. ever put the, the three line shirt. And did England want that? I don't know. But coming through the ranks mm. from under 15s all the way through to 21s, I didn't have a problem. Um, I, I played. I only played one game for the 21s uh, when David Platt was manager. Um, I scored as well, and then I just I didn't get seen for the 21s after that. It was. So it was kind of strange why why I never and nobody's really ever put a put a point on or a finger on it why why that was the case. Uh, is that one of the major obstacles that, that the South Asian community still faces? You believe in in the game today at, at the highest level? The the what? the issues the issues at grassroots level are, are well documented and kind of in your face. Um, at, at the higher levels, though, it's it's far more. Um, Covert, it's far more understated. Is that is, is that kind of still your experience? Uh, yeah, definitely. Look, you, you see it. You see it with, with players today. Like you've got the the young boy at Man United, Zidane Iqbal. Now, mm. I don't understand why England didn't go all out and try and get him to represent England. He yeah. would have been a great role model for young English, South British Asian kids coming through. You've got a player playing for one of the biggest clubs in the world in Man United. And obviously he's gone and, and, and chose to play for Iraq and, and fair play to him, obviously. So I don't understand why the FA don't come out and, and, and get the coaches and, and this and that and identify these good Asian players because I know there's a lot out there. There was a boy, um, he just signed for, for Brighton from Bradford. I think they paid about a million pounds for him. He's 16 mm-hmm. years old, Asian player. So they are out there. It's just then you start to wonder why why can't these people in the FA, the coaches, not go and get these players and try and bring them through the ranks in the England setup? Because one, it's a, I I believe it's only a matter of time between before one or two do make it in the in, in the senior team. It has to happen. And if you have one, I'm not I'm, I'm looking at it from a different point of view. If you have one South British Asian player playing for the England national team. That's going to be huge around mm. the glo- around the globe, not just for England, but if if he's Indian or Bangladeshi or Pakistani and he's he's playing for England, that the whole country then follows England. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 one of yeah. those things. You you spoke on the, of the top about the way that the FA are doing um, around addressing South Asians and and the 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 numbers in, in in terms of their participation in the sport. Is this something? that they need to, to you, you, you then spoke about having coaches, South Asian coaches within the South Asian communities working with these kids. Is, is that something that 
the FA needs to pay closer attention to educating, certifying South Asian coaches to go into those communities. I think I think it's getting better, Shaka. Definitely, um, I'm I'm really close to one of the Asian guys within within the FA, um, and they were really close with with the charity football for peace as well with the football centre. So the FA are behind it. Like the look, probably five to ten years ago, I would have uh, totally disagreed with what the FA are doing, saying they're not doing enough. Mm-hmm. Now they're trying to do enough. I know there's one one of the coaches out there, an Asian coach. He's got his A license. A guy called Pav Singh. Now. Only a couple of months ago, he was doing the England C team, which is probably the non-league players playing for for England, representing England. Now, should they not have this guy uh, in the under seventeens, under eighteens, under eighteen, mm-hmm. under eighteens, and then you'll he'll understand a lot more about the game and, and that sort of thing. But it's also uh, he could be a role model for other British South Asian coaches as well. To me, there's not enough in the game uh, players, coaches. Managers definitely. Do you know what I mean? There isn't any. Um, mm-hmm. Like I said before, they always get the over always get overlooked. But as as, as 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 times gone by and within the last two three years, it's it's starting to be a big thing now in, in, in the English game, and they're trying to do a lot more about it. But I think they can try a lot harder as well. As as, as we speak now, it's South Asian Heritage Month yeah. in the UK. What can what can the FA, what can the game do better around the the focus that South Asian Heritage Month brings to to the South Asian communities in terms of, of, of addressing that underrepresentation? What more can be done specifically, if even just for, for a month as, as, as a start? Well, I, I know they did a, a thing down at, at Trafalgar Square um, mm. last last week, I think it was, obviously. Everybody knows the film Bend It Like Beckham and yeah. it was all about the Asians and, and that sort of thing. So they bring all of them together at Trafalgar Square for a big event with the Asian community um, and, 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 and that sort of thing. But I think you've got to, you've got to go into the communities, the, the Football Association, the Premier League, the EFL. They have to go straight into the heart of the communities and, and, and your, your, your likes of Birmingham, your Leicester, your Bradfords, they've got to dive in there and try and bring these kids out, bring them and help the parents. Say there is a, a way forward in football for these kids now, because I know it happens. If, if, if they've got a kid in an academy and he gets released, the parents will say he's no good anymore instead of mm-hmm. trying to build his confidence back up and, and try and get him back into football and, and still enjoying it. And look, the FA and the, the Premier League can, can be behind that and, and try and help as much as possible. It's not all about Asian people in, in that community trying to help. We need help from the governing bodies as well of football. Mm. It's not all about Michael Chopra going into Newcastle and, and trying to help kids on, on, on the West Road where, where the main Asian heritage is and, and coaching them. They have to have an, an, an end game and they have to see realise that you do have a future, you do have an end game. This, this could be you in five, six years' time. But like I said before, it all comes from from the, the people at the top. If you don't have the support from the top, it's never going to work. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, the, the focus from, from our, our governing governing bodies, be, be it within sport or within, within society, um, really needs to be um, far more far more intentional in, 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 in what they do. I, I, I want to just change gears a little bit, Michael. You... you uh, one of certainly only a handful of players that I can think of off the top of my head who played for both Newcastle and Sunderland. Yeah. Off the top of my head, I can think of Don Hutchinson, Lee Clark, yeah. Steve Harper, who you mentioned, represented yeah. both clubs. Um, what, what, what was that experience like? <laughs> just just as, as a footballer, as, as somebody who played for yeah. Newcastle? Do you know what? Um, I, look, I remember everything so clear. I remember being in, in Portugal on pre-season for Cardiff. And my phone started ringing. It was withheld number. Um, I answered it and it was an Irish accent. And I was like, who's this? And he was like, oh, Michael, it's Roy Keane. And I was like, I was like, nah, it's not Roy. You, you know what I mean? That's what I mean. And then we just got chatting and look, Roy was brilliant with me. He he understand. He, he said to me, look, it's a big decision for you, but we want to sign you. We want you to move up to the Northeast. Obviously, you're a big Newcastle fan and everything, but 
um, we'd love to have you at the club. And I said, look, right, it is a massive decision. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big black and white, you know that. Um, whenever I've always scored against Sunderland, the celebrations that I do and everything. It's, mm-hmm. But I said, look, I'll be professional. I said, give me a couple of days and I'll come back to you. So I spoke to my to my family about it. And look, they said, go and do it. You've got to you've got to mm. think about your career rather than who you support and, and everything. And um, so yeah, I phoned them back and, and said to them, um, I'd love to come and play for Sunderland, but I'd love to come and, and work under you as a manager because I'm going to learn a lot. You, mm-hmm. you want to manage like a captain for for so many years, and um, I want to learn what what you've been taught by Sir Alex as well. Um, and and why, why was brilliant. Um, I knew that Newcastle fans would hate me. But it was also another thing that I've got to try and win over the Sunderland fans as quick as possible because they had doubts in their mind that why are we signing a, a Newcastle player, a Newcastle fan to come and spearhead our, our team in, in the Premier League. So, look, it, it was tough at the start, but Roy was brilliant with me. He said, look, if you get off to a great start, then then the fans are going to be really behind you. Um, he said, I'm not going to start you in the first game against Tottenham. He says, I'll ease you into it because I don't want to put too much pressure on you. So I think he brought me on about 75 minutes, I think it was. Uh, it was nil nil at the time. And it was at the, at the stadium of light. And uh, the ball come in the box and I've, I've scored and we, we won the game 1-0 and <laughs> straight away. Do you, do you know when a weight's just been lifted off your yeah. shoulders? Oh, yeah, yeah. The fans have taken to me straight away. They, they know I'm not just here because I'm picking up money and that sort of thing. I want to do well for the football team. Um, and it was brilliant. We, we were, it was an early kickoff, so we were top of the league and for, for a few hours and we, we beat right. Tottenham uh, 1-0 and it was Roy's first win as a Premier League manager. We went to Birmingham on the Tuesday night uh, and we drew 2-2 and I, I scored as well. So I'm thinking, this is, mm-hmm. this is brilliant. This one. Yeah, so obviously when, when I signed for Sutherland, I had to... I had to get off to a flyer um, because I knew the the fans had to take to me as quick mm. as possible. We played Tottenham the first game. We won one 0 I scored the winner. It was it was brilliant. I was on such a high, and the fans took to me straight away. We then played Birmingham on the Tuesday night, um, and we drew two two, and I scored. So after after two games, I've scored two goals for Sunderland. The, the fans are loving me. We've got four <laughs> points from two games. It's uh, it, it's brilliant. What a way to start! And, and <laughs> contrast that. I know you also you also played in India. Yeah. So how how was that experience? Obviously, obviously being India myself, uh, I wanted to try and give something back to the country and and let them see Michael Chopra that's played in the Premier League in India. Now, India taught me a lot about life. Um, mm. I'm not afraid to admit admit this. When I was playing in the Premier League, I thought I was bigger and better than anybody else. Uh, I was doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. Once I went to India, it, it totally changed the way I, uh, I look at life and totally made me appreciate what life is all about. You're living in a five-star hotel, but as soon as you come out of the hotel and you've got little kids begging you for money and living on the streets, and that's what life's all about. It's not about earning X amount of money being a Premier League footballer. What life's all about is how these young kids are living and, and that sort of thing. And so whenever I go to to give them money, people would always say to me, don't give them any money because they go and give it to somebody that's looking after them like a mafia sort of thing. So what I'd normally do is go to a Starbucks and, and get loads of cakes and give them cakes, give them balloons mm-hmm. and, and just make them happy, put a smile back on the face. Uh, but look, in, India was brilliant. Uh, I really enjoyed my time there, really enjoyed playing in the, f- the football stadiums. Played there for two years and we got to the final both years. Um, playing for Sachin Tendulkar's team, I mean, mm-hmm. Sachin was a dream come true. Being Indian and one being one of the best cricketers in the world, you know what I mean? Obviously, yeah. you know from Brian yes. Laura and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, it was it, it was it was a special moment for me playing in India with my heritage and my roots and learning the culture and, and everything. It was it was such a dream. Listen, you, you don't have to be Indian to be a Sachin Tendulkar <laughs> fan. I'll tell you that right now. What an incredible, incredible cricketer, yeah. incredible person. Michael, I, that's a, a fantastic point to close on. Um, I feel that often our impacts after the game far exceed the impacts or certainly our own feeling of self, self-worth while, while we're in it. 
you were an example to, to an entire community um, as a player. And now as an ex-player, as an ambassador, as somebody who's trying to bring the game and grow the game within that, within that community, within your community, you, you again stand head and shoulders above, above so many else. You're, you're a f- fantastic example to us all. I, I'm, I'm delighted to, to have had you not just be part of the Northeast, but part of our work here at Show Recently Red Card. Uh, continued, continued successes. Um, it, it really has been a, a joy to, to, to watch your progress through the game, to speak with you today, and look forward to, to what's to come for you, from you in, in the future. Thanks so much for your time. I just want to say thank you, Shaka, for giving me this opportunity and everything. Look, it's a, it's a pleasure. And for people out there, if I can try and change the minds and how people go about what they do in life, if it, even if it's 1%, then, then it makes me happy. If I can put smiles back on people's faces, then that's what, mm-hmm. what I'm here to do. And that's obviously you, you do a lot for show races and the red card and, and everything. And I follow what all, all you guys do. And it's, it's a privilege and honour to speak to you again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shaka.